Welcome to another uh, edition of All Access. So um, once again, uh, uh, we we have a lot to discuss, and uh, and for the second time in a row, I'm going to do something uh, that I did last week, uh, which is bring on a brilliant researcher working in the Avalanche ecosystem, and have most of the the All Access show dedicated to uh, finding out more from him about the cool things that he is working on. So uh, before I do that, let's uh, let me briefly recap where we are and uh, briefly recap the major things that happened this week. So number one, big announcement was Tencent. This is yet another one in the series of Alibaba followed by AWS and now Tencent choosing Avalanche. They chose Avalanche and they decided to become a, a supporter because they understand that there will, there's going to be, there's already uh, a lot of demand for subnets. There's already a lot of demand for blockchain-based services, application-specific chains, and they want to be in the business of providing infrastructure services to people who want to launch their own chains. So this is nothing new. And uh, uh, to, to those of you who've been following along, this is exactly as uh, we predicted two years ago and exactly as we thought that things would, uh, would play out. And now they're just playing out exactly the way we said they would. Uh, this is something that happens quite often, if I may digress for a second, that uh, that happens quite often uh, to me in general. I was just talking to the, to a few friends of mine this, uh, this morning, and, uh, and they were pointing out that there are certain communities out there that fight you the whole damn time and then come around very slowly to exactly what you said. So this happens to me all the time. It's, it's again, something that I've gotten used to. I'm about three years ahead of, uh, of at least this space. So things that become obvious to me because of, uh, of, of you know, tight integration with, with, with the cutting edge, you know, take a while to percolate. So, you know, by the time the hat guy wakes up and realizes, hey, you know, I've been pushing a piece of crap onto the masses and really, you know, everybody was zigging while, uh, while you know, these hat guys were pushing their bags, et cetera. Uh, that's, uh, uh, it's just sort of, uh, and then, you know, switches. Uh, that's, it takes about three years. So I've been saying a whole bunch of things. I think those of you who have been with me for a while know all, of, all about them. You know all about the subnet vision. You know all about the, the, uh, uh, the all sorts of cautions and so forth that I've, I've mentioned about, uh, about the vision for how, how blockchains will evolve. And now you get to see what exactly is happening in the field. There are many, 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 many people who are ready to launch subnets and uh, who are ready to launch their own chains. There are only a few chains that can absorb that growth and have the right architecture for absorbing that growth. And now you're seeing a push in that direction. So Tencent was great. It was exactly in that, uh, in that line of, um, of Alibaba AWS. And uh, there will be undoubtedly more to come. I don't know what's going to come, but, uh, but there will be more, more services of this kind, I'm sure. And in fact, there will be striated services. I've, I've used this phrase before. Um, at the moment, we're in the very early days of validation services. Not all validators are made equal. And uh, at the moment, people just want to have some decentralization, uh, but they will be much more discerning about the kinds of validators that they need. They might want high compute, high storage. They might want certain jurisdictions, et cetera, et cetera. There's all sorts of things that you might ask. Where they, might, they might want SGX-based validation. Who knows? There's a lot of exciting things to do there. And that space is going to take at least half a decade to develop. Uh, but, uh, but we're at the forefront of it and, uh, and it's just starting and you're beginning to see the trends in the Avalanche ecosystem. The second thing I should mention is uh, Loco. Ava, Ava Labs partnered with Loco, the Indian streaming platform. This is a big deal. So if you're in India, um, you're into esports. This is the platform that everybody uses. They're not into esports, it's like it's used for by a bunch of other people as well. And um, so this is big. It brings a lot of users to our ecosystem. All of these users will ideally, if we if we all do our jobs right, if we all build the software correctly, the, the users should come in not realizing they're actually dealing with a blockchain. So they won't have to first initially, you know, when they show up to, to, to watch something, hopefully they won't be. Uh, forced to write down 24 key phrases, seed phrases, etc. Uh, but instead, they will have a seamless experience interacting with a blockchain without even realizing that they're doing so, and that's going to be fantastic. We can, we will sh slowly shift their activities, uh, and uh, as they as they voluntarily opt in, uh, they can in interact more and more with various services on chain. Uh, let's see. A third and final thing that was important this week in the Avalanche ecosystem was the Core Wallet. 
It just introduced cross-signing, cross-chain transaction signing technology. What this means is I can have uh, open the Avalanche C-Chain. I'm doing my C-Chain activities, but I want to do a trade on the Exalot, which executes on a different subnet. I can do this without this concept of, uh, of having to switch modes, having to switch networks. And so seamlessly, I can say, okay, yeah, just uh, inject this transaction into the Dexalot subnet, and that can just happen uh, without having to, to, uh, to, to change the UI. This is a huge improvement in user experience because otherwise without this, you typically have to switch out and back, out and back. The DAP chain vision cannot be brought forth with MetaMasks of the world. MetaMask is old tech. It's, it's ancient. It's from, uh, I don't know, what, two years ago. It assumes a slow chain underneath, and uh, it assumes one chain at a time. It's built by people with multi-assets in a single chain. So Avalanche is not like that. It was always, from the ground up, built for multi-asset, multi-chain world. So it was built for a world where we had multiple chains in parallel. And that's exactly the universe that we've created, exactly the universe that Dexalot is operating in, and, and others, of course. And uh, that uh, multi-chain signing uh, transaction signing technology makes it makes the user experience really nice, really, really seamless. So check it out. It's just there. If you interacted with Dexalot, um, I think uh, those of you who may or may not have watched the, the, the podcast last week, uh, they, they did not confirm or deny that there would be an airdrop to people who interacted with Dexalot. So, uh, uh, so um, I suggest, you know, everybody interacts with Dexalot. It's just fun to do. They need, the, they need our support as community members. They need our support in debugging everything they've built. Uh, but check it out, and uh, this just makes it a lot easier, a lot nicer. So uh, those are the three big things that happened this week. I tried to just limit myself to the, the, the biggest, highest uh, items and the most important ones. Uh, the other thing that uh, I think I should say something about was that uh, uh, Polygon had a ginormous reorg, 158 block reorg, I think, or 156 block reorg, whatever it is. So a huge reorg. Now, first of all, everybody's up in arms about how long that reorg is. Um, Scientifically speaking, it's just the you know the, the the it makes no sense whatsoever to accept any reorg at all. If if your proof of stake chain is properly built, if you know what you're doing, you should never have any reorgs. Absolutely none. Avalanche has had none in its two and a half year history. So if you're building protocols that have reorgs and are proof of stake. It's, uh, you know, everybody who knows what they're doing is going to look at you like, you know, with that look. And uh, it's hard to do that look, but I think I'm doing it right now. It's just like, well, well, what is this? You know, it's, it's very, very, um, uh, it's kind of hard to explain uh, the, the mix of feelings and emotions behind that look, but you know when you receive it, right? You know, when you're a kid and you're messing with things and you know, it's, it's like, you know, and then, the, and then the adults in the room look at you like, okay. Uh, you did something, but uh, clearly you did everything wrong. So um, proof of stake systems must have finality. They, they have the ability to give you full finality in a single slot. If the protocol you built does not have that, then I think you should look you know, deep within and, and, and wonder about why, why you're unable to do that. Um, Avalanche gives you single slot finality. It's the moment the transaction is final, it's final. There is no reorging and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and changing of the of the... Uh, of the blocks. So somehow Polygon has used to have 50 something uh, block reorgs and people were, were used to that. They would, uh, exchanges would accept things as final after some number of blocks of higher than 50, but, but it wasn't higher than 150. So this 150 block reorg completely messed up a lot of, uh, a lot of things. Uh, it's just not surprising. And uh, there's a lot of discussion to be had, of course, on, on, on buying technology. And, uh, but I'm not going to get into that because it's all sort of negative territory. Just want to point out the, the one undeniable scientific fact, which is uh, proof of stake systems have the ability to give you single slot finality. And if you don't have it, then you need to go back to the drawing board and uh, redesign whatever you did because you clearly left something on the table that's uh, pretty darn important. Okay, so with that, let me introduce our guest for today. I'm so thrilled to bring in uh, Patrick O'Grady. Patrick, are you in here? 
Fantastic. I am you. now, I think. Yeah. yeah. Great to see you. How are you doing? Well, it's Friday, right? So that, that's good. Yeah. That is good. <laughs> I mean, it's not, not like your Saturdays are any different from your Fridays. But come on. Who yeah. are you kidding? This is, this is one of the yeah. most hardworking people I know. And, uh, you know, I keep, a t I keep tabs on people I know who work harder than I do. And, uh, and um, you know, it was, it was, it was easy in, in when I was an academic. And uh, uh, occasionally my, my graduate students would surpass me and then they would get their PhD, then they'd, they'd go off. Um, but, uh, but at Ava Labs, I, I, I'm surrounded by people who work incredibly hard. Patrick, Patrick's right up there. Where are you? Are you you're on the West Coast right now, right? Yeah, yeah, in California, right? So Great. I, uh, yeah. Do you, do you want to tell New people York. about what you do for Ava Labs? Yeah, so um, I'm the uh, head of engineering uh, here. I think people also call me the VP of engineering. I, I prefer the, the head term because VP sounds a little like kind of corporate for what I feel like I do, <laughs> which is just uh, work with really smart people on technical strategy and then occasionally, you know, get my hands dirty on different different types of projects or different sort of support. Uh, but yeah, um, really just all things engineering at Avalab. So um, here, everyone, I have a team of, you know, amazing people that report into me uh, that go from, you know, everything bridge, core, uh, platform, infrastructure, custody, you, know, you name it, right? Um, and mm -hmm. so my job is really just to find great people and then hopefully make sure that they're doing something that provides value to uh, Avalabs and Avalanche. So tell us a little bit about your journey. So how did we end up here? Shall we go back to the beginning of time? Shall we go yeah. back, go back to yeah, the beginning sure. of time? Where did it all start? Patrick yeah, so born I spent, yeah, I mean, I spent the first 18 years of my life in the Midwest in Wisconsin. Um, and so very far away from the bubble of all this stuff. I didn't know about blockchain or Bitcoin or anything. No, when I was back home, no one was ever talking about any of this, uh, like, uh, darn flap and like technology stuff. Right. And so, uh, but when I was a kid, I just really liked computers. And so um, I would ask my mom to take me to the dump uh, and we would go pick up old computers and like old lawn mowers and old whatever and bring them to our garage. And she let me take them apart to figure out how they worked. Um, and, you know, the first time that ever happened, I was hooked. Uh, you know, you couldn't get me to read a book. You couldn't get me to like, you know, do all the stuff like that. I was just so interested and excited by taking old computers and just figuring out how they worked. Um, and so that, you know, one thing led to another. And, um, you know, I was uh, just hanging out in Wisconsin and, and it really was something that I think is a great place for raising a family. And, you know, I had a lot of friends there, but if you're trying to, you know, get involved in the technology ecosystem, I think it leaves a lot to be desired. And so uh, when it was time to go to college and academia or, and start to pursue that path, uh, I uh, was like, well, where could I go? Well, you can go out east to like the Harvards of the world and whatever, if you want to become a hedge fund trader, or you can go out west and like build crazy shit. We'll figure out what that actually ends up being. Um, and uh, I went out west, toured uh, Stanford, um, and was you know blown away. I wrote my college essay while I was here, and fortunately got in early, and so uh, came out here and have been in now the Bay Area for about almost ten years now, which is pretty crazy. I don't think that was really ever the plan, but uh, I met uh, met someone special here, and so we've just been hanging out, living here for the past nine or ten years. So, Amazing, yeah. isn't there though? There's like a side story here with uh, with you playing football and so forth as well. Yeah, I mean. So when I, uh, uh, you know, I'm a tall guy, so I'm like six, four. So, uh, when I was, um, growing up, I, uh, I was six foot, six foot one in about sixth grade. So, uh, there wasn't anyone within a foot of me in most, most areas and especially amongst my age. So like, it was pretty easy for me to stand out in sports and, you know, just about anything. And sometimes to really like, uh, you know, if I'm feeling down, I'll throw in like my fifth grade football highlight tape and it just, you know, it, it amps me up to a <laughs> back, back to the back to get some energy. In me. But had a lot of fun. I really liked playing football. Actually, I was uh, I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, and fortunately, had some uh, like sports injuries, neck and head injuries um, when I was in high school. And um that really changed my trajectory in terms of what uh, I was interested in doing. So uh, I was, you know, just like every wide-eyed kid in Wisconsin wants to go play football at University of Wisconsin or like, you know, go be a pro athlete or something like that. Um, my journey changed and I was like, well, what should I do now? 
And at that point, uh, I got more into entrepreneurship and more into business and more into technology. And so I started a company where I would help um, old people uh, with their computers. So people that, you know, really just wanted to figure out what technology could mean in their lives. And um, uh, I donated half the money to a school in the inner city where I taught a class on technology to kids because I think technology is the great, you know, enabler for people of any background to do things that, you know, that are different than what their parents could do. Um, and so I'm very passionate about that whole endeavor. But um, really what it meant was fate had a way of putting me on a track that I think looking back was a much better track. So especially what's what's coming out with like head injuries and everything that's terrible that happens with football players. It's going to be great that hopefully I can remember like my kids' names when I'm 50 years old. So I'm, I'm very okay that that path changed. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and then how did you not uh, not get drawn into the AI and uh, ML stuff that uh, I'm sure was a, was very big at Stanford at the time? Yeah. So <laughs> the joke I tell is that when uh, at that time uh, at Stanford you had three options. One option was rockets, like that was like primo SpaceX trying to land the rockets. You had blockchain, like that was the first sort of surge of Bitcoin. And then you had AI that was like, you know, very early, like it was obviously nowhere near as capable as today, but people were super excited about it. Um, and I actually took a class um, from Bology, who was the CTO of Coinbase and previously Earn, where they gave away these free, um, it's anyone that took the class. You these, have one of those Bologi uh, toaster things? Yeah, the 21 miners. Yeah, um, so okay. it's, it's like a Raspberry Pi with a soldered on ASIC. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was interested in Bitcoin. I, I didn't know anything. A stop, lot stop, about stop, 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 stop. Hang on, hang on, hang on. The audience does not know what those are and it wasn't in focus. So hold it by your head because it's still not. Oh, there we go. It's a. Uh, it's like a Raspberry Pi with a giant heat sink on it, right? If I remember these things correctly. Yeah, so it's it's actually two chips. So the bottom is the Raspberry Pi, which which had like the block, like Bitcoin's history on it. And then on the top was an ASIC. <laughs> and the ASIC was soldered onto it, or there's like a, you know, kind of screwed on here. And then that would communicate with Bitcoin's mining pool. Or, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, 21's mining pool, yeah. Right. So Balaji, of course, uh, for those of you who don't know, is, a, is an OG in the, in the space. And uh, you start the company uh, based around these miners. And the vision then was that these miners would be everywhere, that you would have your like hot water heater with uh, yep. powered by 21 miners. So not only would you heat your water, but you'd also in the background uh, mine Bitcoin. And, uh, and it all made sense back then because we did not have efficient, efficient protocols for, um, uh, that allowed us to decentralize blockchains. So that all, of course, has, has changed Im immensely. Balaji left that startup, went to Coinbase. Um, don't want to hijack this discussion or, or give too much detail about irrelevant things. Yeah. But uh, but those things are, are are a historical relic. They're they're going to be in a museum someplace. I'm glad you well, got so, them. Yeah, I mean, um, so the funny thing with that is like the whole class was about using that little thing as a web server, mm -hmm. and then there was like a specific port that you were supposed to run on your web server that was called like the pay port. And that's when Bitcoin was still super cheap to use. So like everything was about using that thing to create micro payments on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like you said, like some of those ideas have come and gone, but like it was a really cool eye opener for like this, you know, young kid from Wisconsin to like understand uh, what was going on. And it was really cool because I got this free miner. So I mined Bitcoin uh, at Stanford in my dorm room uh for uh, just to just to see what it was obviously a very small asic so i didn't really make any money but mm -hmm. it was kind of fun right so it was, uh, it was a fun experience but, that's uh, awesome so yeah tell so I, I got really pulled in that way yeah. gotcha so tell us about the the post stanford experience so left stanford then what happened yeah so um after stanford um i uh was really interested in crypto um but at that time i feel like i still didn't have super strong conviction over my personal principles of what crypto would be or should be um, but i really thought the entire thing you know still made a lot of sense to me and i still wanted to work on it so i figured you know what better place to go to than coinbase so um, i applied for a job at coinbase um, and, uh, at Coinbase, I, I ended up uh, getting the job fortunately, and I joined their crypto engineering team. Um, and so the crypto engineering team at Coinbase, you know, when I used to tell people about it, they're like, they assume that Coinbase is like, you know, has thousands of people in these crypto engineers. No, 
Uh, when I joined, there was about 20 of us that uh, basically handled all crypto engineering at Coinbase. Um, and so some people, you know, you're familiar with, uh, you know, were some of my mentors there, but, um, you know, it was a great experience. I basically joined in the middle of the last bear market. So times were bleak. Like uh, I joined and I also joined symbolically on like April 15th uh, in, uh, you know, as like a thing. And then Bitcoin at that point had just dropped another 20%. Half the engineering team at Coinbase had just left uh, out of attrition because they were like, crypto is dead. Like, let's move on to the next thing. So, uh, you know, it was an interesting time to get into it. But as a result, there was huge opportunity to learn and play a huge role in, in actually working on Coinbase engineering. Uh, and so I found a number of really awesome mentors there uh, that I thought were, it, it really just helped along, along, helped me along my way. And then as a result, um, ended up working on a project there called Rosetta, uh, which is a universal open source spec for reading and writing from blockchains. And you know, naturally you may say, well, why work on that? Well, the Coinbase, you can imagine that anything you can do to make it faster to interact with new blockchains or more reliable and like less maintenance heavy to interact with existing blockchains is worth a lot of, you know, it provides a lot of value to them. And so um, I got to meet with tons of awesome teams um, in the space to learn how all their stuff worked and then try to come up with like an, a universal specification Coinbase could use. So that's um, how you, you came to know just about how every blockchain works in intimate detail, right? Through yeah, I mean, as a spec writer, right? Like if, if like that one thing that one chain does, like doesn't fit into your like hierarchy of taxonomy or whatever you're going to use, like, well, you can't use a spec anymore, right? So like my job was like find exceptions to the rule and figure out how to mm -hmm. fit them into the rule or like come up with a new rule that makes sense. And so as a result, I think at one point, uh, at least there were like 35 or 40 different implementations uh, that I would look at and review and understand how they fit into it, um, which was a lot of fun, huge learning experience. And as a result, really learned my personal principles of what I thought was important in crypto. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was just an awesome experience. I can't say enough positive things about Coinbase and what Coinbase has you know, mm -hmm. meant to my career. And if you're looking to get into crypto for the first time, and you're looking for a job to do that, working at a place like Coinbase is a, a great place. And uh, to sending people started. away from Ava Labs, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> I have to give credit where credit's due. They gave me a chance. No, no, you're yeah. right. You're 1, I think Ava Labs is great uh, for a lot of things. I think for people that know nothing about crypto and have no idea what they're doing and just want to like get their feet wet at a company that will pay them a paycheck, it's an interesting place to get started. Mm -hmm. That's all. How long yeah. were you at Coin Coinbase again? Um, so I was at Coinbase for about a year and nine months, and then I consulted for the following nine months on Rosetta. That's so. uh, that's amazing. So uh, is this where when when we reveal to the audience what how old you are? No, no, I, I never reveal that. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we talk about your age? You're one of the youngest people that I've known who uh, who 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 essentially heads an engineering organization, right? So I think by now people have picked up on the fact that you are under thirty. Yeah, I still I still have to I still have time to make the elusive thirty under thirty list. <laughs> uh, yeah, but Kevin Kevin's on that list. Kevin Sekniki is on that list. Another another of our labs veteran. So uh, no, I, I'm so lucky to be surrounded by such brilliant uh, people. But uh, uh, yeah, if you want, we'll leave your age uh, out of the conversation. But uh, but I think people can put. Put, uh, put put some things together. So, um, uh, okay. So I remember when uh, when Kevin and I uh, saw your application for, for Ava Labs and we were so thrilled. And uh, from my perspective, you know, going from academia to, uh, to, to my own company, it was not clear to me that we'd be able to attract, you know, the kinds of people that, that I was able to recruit at Cornell. Cornell has a very well-established brand at the time. You're employee number what, 12, 17, something like that, right? At Ava Labs? Yeah, it was, it was pretty small at that time. It was pretty yeah. small, 20 ish at most. Yeah. And, um, and it wasn't it, the core, the initial crowd was all people I knew, was all mostly people I knew initially from my Cornell days. And it wasn't clear that, that we'd be able to, to attract super, super, super stars. And, um, and I remember thinking, you know, with your application, we're going to make it because the tech here that we have is so strong that we're able to get people of this caliber. And, uh, and I was so thrilled to, to chat with you. So then now let's, let's jump into Ava Labs days. 
Um, it's how long has it been with with Alva Labs? It's just been two, two over, years. just a bit over two years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I joined about three months after mainnet launch, I think. Great. Yeah. And what have you what have you done in that time frame? Ha. <laughs> no, all right, I'm not all right, Elon, question. I'll prepare my list of all my code changes. No, that, that no, no, that uh, that's a ridiculous. No, so, I mean, field. funny enough, right? Like I joined as an engineer originally, so I joined as an IC from Coinbase, um, yeah. and my my hope was to, uh, you know, I at Coinbase just to kind of tie the two together, right? Like I had a bunch of fun helping people come out with different abstractions and stuff, but at some point I was like, you know. <laughs> this is great and all, but I'd rather be on the other side. <laughs> like I'd rather be figuring out how to adhere to this open source spec with all sorts of really crypto native, you know, virtual machines and runtimes and technologies than building abstractions on top. Now building those abstractions on top is still super important for everything that we're doing. And obviously we have tons of people at Ava Labs dedicated to that, but my personal interest was just going deeper. And so joining Ava Labs was about joining uh, the platform team here, which was working on the Avalanche Go client. Um, and so uh, Stephen, who many of you know, uh, got me started by working on some config PRs, which I butchered, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, then eventually got sucked more into the core of the uh, EVM. And so I spent a ton of time working on Core ETH, um, which is our, uh, you know, basically which runs the C chain, working on different enhancements there, performance improvements, safety improvements, everything like that. And so that really defined the first bit of time. But through that process, um, started to really uh, get a grasp of what the company's, you know, technical strategy was and helping to, you know, continue to define that on a go forward basis is what it eventually became. And then as needed, uh, I feel like I can't make really strong strategic decisions without having a very hands-on um, approach to understanding technology because it changes so quickly. Um, and so I forced myself, maybe you could ask some of the engineers here, somewhat to the chagrin of my management to uh, work on, uh, you know, technic the actual technical problem still so I can keep, you know, a really close eye on what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So simply put, I think Patrick is just one of the best hackers I've met and, um, uh, and uh, not only so typically when you when when you hang out with hackers they tend not to not to be good at management and uh, and 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 not to like do doing people things uh, Patrick happens to be excellent at both so uh, so he quickly rose through the ranks at Ava labs to to head the uh, the engineering side the dev side of uh, the organization so I won't ask you this open-ended question of everything you worked on because clearly you've had a hand in just about everything that came out of Ava labs related to uh, just related to everything, not, not just Avalanche to the platform, but also, uh, you know, you, you managed Core, the wallet, you managed a bunch of things. You even managed um, uh, the Enclave effort in its nascent days before, before it got spun out into its own separate, separate entity. So let's talk, if you would, about your latest, greatest pet project. And... Uh, so, uh, so do we want to want to step into Hyper SDK? So we just announced this last week. We just announced it maybe three, four days ago. And um, do you want to tell the audience what it is, what it does? Yeah, sure. So uh, while I do that, I'm just going to pull up, you know, background a bit of of what's going on here because I, I find that it's easier just to kind of keep keep track of it with that. So at least I'll just keep the logo up because I'm in love with this uh, <laughs> the logo that the that the team put together. And I it's think, such a fantastic uh, logo. And I think sure. that, uh, like, funny enough as it is, uh, I'm presenting now is like. Uh, so good. logos make or bake a lot of open source projects. Like some people just love working on open source code because it like looks cool or it's fun or whatever like that. Right. And this is an open source project. Right. So first mm -hmm. of all, just to have a background up there. Uh, but um, yeah, Hyper SDK has been something that, uh, you know, really is the culmination of years of like architectural work from the entire platform team, uh, you know, the company and everyone there, uh, you know, um, and the Hyper SDK is really, the cherry on top that pulls together all of the learnings we've had over the last number of years of developing Avalanche, the platform. Um, and the Hyper SDK, you know, it's in the name, right? Hyper. This thing is dedicated really to out of the box, giving people that want to build their own blockchain performance right away by constraining a bit how they develop what they're doing but not so much that it limits you from doing whatever you're, you're like really cool stuff with it. But, you know, we'll handle a bunch of stuff behind the scenes and make really efficient decisions for you. You just worry about 
the stuff that matters to you, the application level, you know, things. And, you know, before I get into any specifics, the first question usually people ask is, well, why? Well, you know, on Avalanche today, um, I think almost all of the subnets that are currently. And so, you know, people love the EVM. You know, I, have, I think that's pretty clear. Like, it's been a lot of attention on that. And so, you know, many people that are, you know, testing out subnets for the first time, they really want their own token and they want to use that token on the EVM. Um, but, you know, that's one particular way to deploy subnets. And I think a lot of people uh, have the impression that, like, that's the only way you can do it. And, like, that's the only, and, like, whatever you get out of that is as fast and as performant as Avalanche just can be which couldn't be further from the truth. Like that is a virtual machine runtime running on top of Avalanche's consensus networking storage layer, right? And so the Hyper SDK is dedicated to opt using Avalanche specific optimized mechanisms to provide native performance on Avalanche in a totally new environment. So this is building from scratch, um, you know, basically taking our best ideas that we've incorporated into all the different virtual machines we've built over the last few years and making it accessible to you. Yeah. Okay, so overall, so just to recap for people who uh, may or may not be tech savvy. So I think everyone understands that Avalanche is a system that is not a single chain, but is, uh, is one that's multi-chain. These uh, chains are colloquially called subnets at the moment. And uh, each and every one of these chains can be application specific and can run its own virtual machine. And Hyper SDK is a framework for building those virtual machines, right? And um, until, I mean, uh, until Hyper SDK, we, uh, we essentially made a bunch of decisions that gave the most amount of flexibility to people who are developing their own virtual machines. And, um, and that flexibility is, is great. I think that allows us to be super performant. It allows us to be super general. I can go into any meeting knowing that, hey, um, we can just accommodate whatever you want to do. Uh, and that's in contrast with competitors who have tried to wedge in their own tokens, their own technologies, their own co points of control into their architecture uh, for various different reasons. But we did explicitly did not do that. We don't have a common hub, for example. We don't have centralization. We don't have any imposed bottlenecks in our architecture. Um, but one thing that I, I know, Patrick, you got a lot that, that I got a lot in the early days was, okay, well, I want to build my own thing. Where do I start? So yep. how do I build my virtual machine? What, what's, what's the framework? What's the SDK? And now the answer is in some fantastic font, Hyper SDK, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, I think it's the Blade Runner font. That font will come back. I know yeah. that font. Well, that font was very cool in the 80s. And then it disappeared, and now it has to come back because it's so freaking cool. And yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that's exactly right. Like we, for a long time, we're like, hey, if you want to build your own virtual machine, like you should fork, you know, Spaces VM, you should fork Blob VM, you should fork Timestamp VM, or whatever. For, some people are forking Geth, right? Yeah, and I mean, and the result was, well, you end up having to manage a bunch of code you don't understand at all. Uh, and it, we're talking about tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lines of code here. And, uh, you know, it, there, it's not only that, like it's just really hard to get started. There's just so much redundant stuff. There's so much uh, like mm -hmm. maintenance involved in applying changes. And so the idea was let's just take out like the core architecture that you need behind the scenes, but you probably don't have a super strong opinion on. We'll do that for you and hide all that behind different abstractions and then give you meaningful abstractions that you can interact with to, first of all, make it way faster. And second of all, to make it much more understandable. Like this should be trivially correct when you're looking at it, not jumping through 15 lines of code all the way into the core of the block producer or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's it, it achieves hopefully both of those goals, which is make it faster and easier and to manage as well as actually provide great performance too. Yeah. Exactly. So in my experience and uh, uh, of, of looking into virtual machines, they are incredibly complex. And uh, you would imagine that there is a hard core in it of, you know, whatever opcode and execution bits, etc. They're fairly straightforward, but there's often layers upon layers of very intricate code. Um, so for get, for example, the gas calculations, etc. They're fairly complex. They're not germane to most people. Hey, people want to come in and change, change how things work. And it's very, very difficult because the interactions uh, are, um, are hard to manage. 
So what a lot of people would benefit from greatly is just some really flexible, highly modular base uh, with, on which they build their own custom specific VM. So um, we can talk all day about this whole process, but maybe uh, it would be much more efficient if you kind of showed us what one can do. And, um, and uh, I've been tweeting about this, um, so, uh, so I'll mention it just, just for the audience. So Patrick's been doing something kind of crazy for the last three days, is it? Which is coding in public. Um, I, I wanted to do this, but I don't get to code as much as I would like to. So my coding hours and so forth are all interspersed. But he's been doing it and, and very successfully, I might add. So, uh, so he did, he built something in the last, over the last few days. And, uh, and it was sort of all done on Twitter, all open, etc. So do you want to show people how this thing works and, and what you did with it? Yeah, so to provide a little bit of context here, obviously we develop in the open with everything, all of our stuff is open source. Um, but in this case, developing the open means, at least for me was like, as I'm thinking about stuff, like what to implement, how to implement it, blockers I run into, I post those. So you can kind of go through the experience with me of building the virtual machine, right? Like, I think it's tempting to post like a summarized version that makes you look like you knew what you were doing the whole time, <laughs> right? Which when you're developing yeah. is not not necessarily the, always the case. And so I wanted to provide a much more um, realistic view of like what it actually looks like to build your own virtual machine. Um, and so uh, when the Hyper SDK was originally released, um, I put out a something called the Index Virtual Machine. Now the Index Virtual Machine was a project I've wanted to do forever which is making decentralized data into the centralized web more useful by providing a context layer to it. Now, I think this is still really cool and I, I find it personally very interesting. But what I found was that I was trying to get people to understand the Hyper SDK in a new context, something that they knew nothing about. So I was really asking them to understand two things, not just one thing, right? So over the last few days, or really almost immediately after the Hyper SDK release, I was like, damn it, I should have done something that was a little bit easier to understand, but still was cool. And so that's where the token VM came in. And so the token VM is, you know, should make sense to pretty much anyone in crypto, which is you can mint tokens, you can modify those tokens, you can trade those tokens all on chain. And so people get that. And so I was like, great, we'll, we'll go with that approach. And then I'll put together a really simple demo that you can run locally that you can interact with. Now, uh, for people on here, I have to be clear, uh, I am not a UI engineer. The most UI <laughs> I ever do is a CLI, which is what, is what you see in front of you here. Um, and so it'd be great. And I think people, because this one is so much more approachable, uh, will be possible to uh, you know implement a UI on it that's actually meaningful. But so what I have here on the left-hand side is a local running network of five avalanche nodes. So they're just running locally, you know, standard stuff. They're all validators and they all validate a subnet where I deployed token VM onto. Now you may say, oh, you know, do I have to do all this setup, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, it's one line. So you just run scripts run.sh and it spins up everything for you and you can interact with the network live. Now, you know, I could make it difficult to interact with, but I was like, well, it'd be easy just to have a, a CLI that's like a super CLI that does just about everything for you. Um, and so, uh, and then on the top, Again, I'm not a UI person, so I was like, but for people to understand what's going on, we need a block explorer. So I implemented a block explorer in the CLI as well. So all this is open, you can check it out. Um, but to kind of show you what's going on here, let me just kind of walk through it. So um, so first of all, uh, you know, this is a token thing. So first I wanna first look at what my balance is of the primary token, which is just called token. So my address here, which is backed by a private key, which is included in the repo, is so can you make it a little bigger, maybe? Yeah. I cannot read. That's like six point font for me. Yeah, that's that's looking better. Thank you. Yeah. And so at the bottom, you can see I have my loaded address, and then I put that in, and then I can get a balance for any token, right? So this is just standard stuff. So you know, my balance of the native token is nine hundred forty-five, whatever you. Is, You're right? typing currently at uh, at a local node. Is that what that is? Yeah, so this is just pointed, this CLI is pointed to a local network I'm running. Now, the point here is just to showcase you can build just about anything you can imagine on this thing. And so the things that you would normally build somewhere else, or maybe you can't build anywhere else, you can build here. Because mm -hmm. the storage, the database, everything is optimized for this particular use case. So I have my token, right? 
Now I'm going to mint another token. So we'll just call this all access token. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to create my token. Uh, I can provide uh, arbitrary metadata to it. Um, oops, I call it create asset. Uh, so all access. Cool. Is this is my token now. Is yeah. So you can see, tokens? obviously it's locally, but you can see how quick it confirms just instantaneously mm -hmm. final. So um, the asset ID here is just uh, this, which is the transaction ID that created the asset. So this is something we also do on the exchange. Uh, now I want to mint myself uh, some of this token. So I'm going to mint myself some of this asset. I created it. I'm the owner. I can mm -hmm. mint myself whatever I want. So uh, here's my asset. It tells me it pulls up quickly the metadata. So that it's called all access. The current supply is zero. I'm going to send myself some token. Let's just give myself a thousand units. Mm -hmm. So cool. I got my token. There's a TX ID. You can see in the Explorer up here, all of this is happening. So, you know, create asset, created my asset with metadata all access, and minted my asset, a thousand of this asset to me. And this is the units, you know, which are arbitrarily defined by you. Cool. So I got my token. I got the native token. Well, now let's make it possible for people to trade. So I'm going to create an order now. So this is the, where it starts to get pretty cool, right? Like it's pretty easy to make a token. Uh, create order. So now I'm going to say, I want anyone to be able to trade the native token for my token. And so native token here is token. And then the in tick is basically the amount of units you have to send per, for the in asset to get the out. So in this case, I'm going to say you have to send uh, one native asset and you get two of my token. So that means it's, you know, the ratios, you can do the math. Um, and so you get one for two. And so, and then I'm going to supply, I have a thousand, I'll supply 500 of those. Cool. So you can see here, I created this order, which is lets you swap one native token for two of mine. I've supplied 500 to it. And this is the order ID. So just to be, maybe I'm a complex trader. I'm also going to put something in the order book. Um, same thing, same asset, but, uh, oops. Uh, same thing, same asset, um, but I'm going to do a slightly different trading ratio. Instead of getting one for two, I'm going to give you uh, one for one, um, which is like kind of stuffing the book higher up, and I'm going to put 250 in there. So this is a, a less good trade for you. Cool. So now I got two orders in the book for this particular thing, and now I'm like, cool, I'm a random person coming up. I want to fill this order, right? So again, this is all on chain, and there's an in-memory order book that mm -hmm. listens for people posting and closing and filling orders, right? So this so is a, I've, a virtual machine with a central limit order book built into it as an addition. Correct. It's kind of like, you kind of like took the Dexalot idea and shoved Dexalot into the VM in some sense, maybe. The whole virtual machine is purpose-built for minting and trading things. And then when we hook up warp messaging, you'll be able to move between these regions uh, natively, which is Fantastic. really cool. So this is... Um, so, and, and let me, before you go on, I yep. don't want people getting confused about what's being shown and what you should really take away from it. So Patrick is showing what he's built, but really the thing that's, that's really cool is the technology behind it, the framework he used and what we're gonna discuss, which is how long it took him and how much effort it was, et cetera. So, yep. so don't get caught up on the, the superficial details of what it is that got built. You know, what are these tokens? What's going on? Are they securities? You know, et cetera. There's a whole mountain of questions that lead us in, in funny directions. They're all, none of them matters. What really matters is he was able to put this stuff together in an, in an insanely short amount of time. So, but Patrick, go ahead. Yeah. So the last thing that really pulls it together then is like, I want to fill an order, right? So I'm going to take the in asset, which I said, the token, and imagine this is someone else but it shows me what my balance is and then I'm gonna trade for this other token. And so you can see that the node natively with its in-memory order book will serve you all the orders in preference of what is best for you with the remaining units that you can trade for it. So in this case, you know, I have a bunch of balance. Let's say I want a lot of this token, right? So I'm gonna select order zero. I'm now gonna send you the value of, you know, let's say 10 of the native token. And then as a result, I'll get 20 of your custom token. Cool, so I'll continue. And then bam, I get it. So you can see here, I just traded 10 for 20. 
Um, and I have all of these new assets that I acquired. And then if I try to do the same thing again, um, you'll see that the order that I interacted with uh, changed. There's now less remaining of that order. Um, so uh, the idea here really is that, uh, you know, you have this thing going on, but the whole point is, can I show you a live demo that I started on Tuesday night at about midnight <laughs> that has a full trading engine built inside of a virtual machine in a couple hundred lines of code? That's exactly. And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And so the, the point here really is the Hyper SDK is meant to enable the people that know how to do all these crazy application specific things to work on those application specific things and build crypto native companies and backends that run entirely on chain. This is all directly interaction with the chain. I have no servers running here. I have nothing custom running here. There's no extra architecture. It is just the chain. Um, and enable them to do so at a high throughput if they follow a small set of rules. And so the Hyper SDK, uh, you know, really is about trying to unlock that vision of how can we make it easier for experimenters to do the stuff they experiment with rather than just, you know, get sucked into all these super minute details that maybe, you know, for most people probably aren't relevant if they're at some throughput. So. Well, so those things are incredibly important, right? You, you have to get them right or else you will get hacked and or you will have a chain halt. You will have, um, you know, wait, let's not mention other chains names, but you'll have one of those scenarios. Uh, you'll have a reorg or a halt or whatnot if you get these things wrong. And, and uh, it's, it's just, it's not easy. And it takes, it takes a lot of effort. And I, I can say this as someone who's gone through it. Um, and, uh, and I know exactly what it takes. It takes... The, the ability to, to have ac accessible to you uh, the expertise of a whole bunch of people like Patrick that is just, just about, you know, if, it's not impossible perhaps, but it's incredibly hard to amass. And so what HyperSDK does is it concentrates all of that in one nice package so that you, the, the person who's building the application-specific solution, have to worry about none of it. You get to write about your application-specific logic you get to write whatever you're comfortable with writing that is unique to you and your business flow or your workflow or your DAP, your application, whatever it might be. And uh, the rest of the complications are simply wrapped behind a whole bunch of convenient covers for you. Am I doing it justice? I probably am not. Yeah, no, I mean, I think like it's really the, the first page of what I would consider like a multi-volume story of what it means to be building on Avalanche. And it, you know, obviously pains me as a, you know, a leader of engineering here that it has taken this long to get to page one, but we had to spend a ton of time behind the scenes building out the reliability of the core platform. Like what actually, what's the virtual machine that runs this? What is the No, I don't think, no, no, I disagree with you on this one. This is not page one. I think, I think the first chapter is all about building the foundations and yeah. the foundation was the consensus protocol. Chapter two would be speed optimizations, all the things that came in with Apricot. So, so we're somewhere in the book and uh, the world is becoming multi-chain. Uh, everybody is beginning to see it. Someday even the ETH maxis will realize that, uh, in any case, <laughs> that, that where we are now is where they needed to be a while ago. So uh, in any case, um, what, uh, what I think, where, where I think where we are is somewhere in the, in the we're not in the middle of the book, you are right. We're somewhere in the- Early on, the, early in the book is what early I Early in the say. book. Yeah. And it's, it's a new chapter on application-specific virtual machine development. So, um, so shall we talk a little bit about what people can do with this? So uh, let, to yep. recap, um, Hyper SDK is incredibly versatile. You can do anything you want with it. Patrick, out in the open, in, in public, did his development, is coding on top of what's this thing that you built, this new specific thing? Is yeah, we're a, calling it the just a token virtual machine. So token. Okay, TVM. Okay, whatever this thing. So you built this token. I'm not in marketing, clearly. It's a, so you are clearly, you should <laughs> never come near marketing. Um, I'm also hoping that uh, the people who are looking at these demos and so forth are kind of like-minded. So I spent my whole life and career building things that have no good graphical front end, right? And so Patrick's of this in the same line of business. All of our demos look kind of like this. And uh, you really have to use your imagination to, to imagine how this would look if it were properly deployed. 
So, um, so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rely on the audience's goodwill that's, and imagination. And that's the next step. So to kind of talk about what people want or what they can get out of this. So the immediate roadmap for what we're doing for the hyper SDK is pretty clear, right? So the first step was let's create a simpler demo that people can actually understand and interact with very easily, sure. right? Like step two, is uh, integrating Avalanche warp messaging. So what we released in the end of December, which allows any two subnets to send messages to each other. So that's what I'm starting to work on basically tomorrow because this is so, more or less complete. Oh, you're starting tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there you go. My Saturdays aren't much different than my Fridays, right? So, so I'm, gonna take, I'm gonna take a time out there. So I know there are a bunch of uh, young um, people who, who want to get into blockchain development and uh, they're umpteen different ways in, uh, but, uh, but a great way that I would have loved to have accessible to me, but I didn't. And so therefore I had to waste a lot of time is to have a mentor walk you through as they develop something. So that's exactly what Patrick is doing. So just follow him on Twitter. Uh, just it's kind of like looking over his shoulder as he writes stuff. He goes down blind alleys, makes mistakes, backs out, redoes things, etc. So it's just programming in the raw. Uh, it's really a fun experience. I suggest everybody who who wants to get into blockchain programming to take a look at this. So that's step two, you said, step three. Yep, step three is devnets, public devnets. And so, you know, it's great to run these things locally and like, yeah, you could, you know, on a supercomputer achieve infinite <laughs> scalability, right? Um, and so what we'd like to do though is now to start to spin up public devnets that anyone can interact with. Um, so we can start to really benchmark these things across multiple data centers, across multiple whatever, and start to continue and continue to optimize the hyper SDK. So as just to be really clear, right? We opened the covers on this one a little early because we wanted the community to be part of its maturation into a production ready tool. And, uh, you know, we could have gone totally in public or in private, done all these audits, run all these private networks, and then eventually just one day been like, here you go, like have fun with it, it's done, right? But instead, we chose the approach of, you know, it's, it's close to being there, don't use it in production yet, there's probably still bugs. In fact, I know there's probably still bugs. Um, and, Let's work on those through together. Let's figure out how to optimize it together and make sure it actually fits the use cases people want to interact with it. So, um, so, so, public so I want to understand. Yeah. So this is this is the question of when mainnet devs do something. That was previous. Yeah. Dev. Devs are doing something. <laughs> Dev is doing something. And then when mainnet is, is the other question. So so once you have a solution that yeah. developed on top of Hyper SDK, and uh, now you're going to show people how to integrate it with other sub subnets using warp messaging, and then that's great. Then what do you do? Do you, do, does it, is it then ready to roll out? Is that what this, this final so about? We'll probably want to do at least two or three dev nets, I would think, where people can really try to break it. Like at that point, we'll really encourage and invite people to see if they can make nodes panic, make, you know, find the bugs that like people in the wild will try to find in your blockchain if you launch it, right? Um, get uh, public audits and everything like that. So um, it really depends on how those dev nets go, I think is the question of, of when they net uh, and what those things look like. So, um, you know, I think uh, it's definitely, hopefully by the end of like the Q2. So I would say like maybe the next three months would be a great time to mature it, test it out. And the real thing for most developers here is we want to get feedback on the current abstractions in the hyper SDK. Because there's no way I got it just right when I released it. There's no way. And so I'm sure that there are some things that are not quite right that I would love to get feedback on and change before we say it's production ready. Because then it gets much more complicated to change. And so the whole point of having this multi-month period is that we can get people externally to build interesting virtual machines that they can't fit maybe in the way they hope to in the hyper SDK. So we can get feedback on those designs and abstractions and change them while it's still in alpha stage. Uh, so that's the primary reason for that time. It's not necessarily like just let the code sit there, although that's certainly part of it. Um, but we'd really like to make sure that the abstractions work for like at least a, a number of use cases. Yeah. So, um, so you know, you, you showed the, the construction of something that you did over what, a uh, few hundred lines of code, over three days of work, uh, that looks kind of like Coinbase, right? And um, I don't know how long it took them to, to come up with their other offerings that are on-chain, but, uh, but this, is, this is one person all out in public on Twitter with a track record just, just doing it in three days. So, um, so that goes for anybody who wants to deploy a blockchain of any kind. 
what, what would you like to see people deploy? What are the kinds of things that one could do? What, what are the kinds of things that you would like to see on top of Avalanche with Hyper SDK? Yeah, so the one big thing we don't have added to this SDK yet that we're going to work on while we're doing the DevNets is the generic smart contracting support via Wasm. And so the reason why I bring that one up is because I think the Hyper SDK is a great platform for people to start to experiment with some of these wild and wacky ideas that will push blockchain forward. One of those has really been like all sorts of crazy smart contracting mechanisms where you maybe want to control just the execution environment of the smart contracting runtime, but not actually like anything else <laughs> behind the scenes. Like maybe you're more of a PL guy, programming languages person, and like you have a beautiful vision for how that should work, but you want to do nothing else uh, with the chain. The Hyper SDK is perfect for you. If you've been looking for that opportunity for your whole life to like just take your ability to write a language and apply it directly, this is the place to do it. Um, and so what I'm really excited to see people do is experiment with all sorts of really interesting smart contract related runtimes because they don't have to worry about all this extra stuff behind the scenes. Well, like the Hyper SDK handles that for you. And so, so that's, that's generically what I'm looking for. So but, you could combine this, you could combine this with a WASM interpreter. That's, that's what I'm hearing from you. You yeah. could presumably combine it with a move interpreter. Yep. You know, that, that space is too big to leave to the Aptos and Sui folks who took umpteen years to deploy their, develop their stuff. And instead we could just, just, you know, now you get the speed of Avalanche, you get the decentralization of Avalanche. Plus now with this flexibility, you could just drop in any kind of interpreter. I don't know, maybe a stripped down version of the JVM, uh, you know, well, sky's the limit in terms yeah, of- Yeah, I mean, like the, the applications right? though, I think are like the other side of it, right? So like, right. you know, with all this done, right? I think a lot of people would like to see like the increased decentralization of the services we use most every day, right? So I think like one thing that has particularly gotten people's attention is obviously like where a lot of the energy of the last few years came in was from DeFi. Right, like the ability that you can perform any sort of financial transaction that you're interested in directly on chain with limited or no intermediaries. So really exploring that frontier with different sort of, you know, trading mechanisms, different sort of lending and financial applications that are really important for people that maybe don't have access to the traditional banking system. You know, that's nothing new. Mm -hmm. But the things where it goes is into like because of the performance. We think that this is going to be much better suited for like really high throughput minting of like NFTs, uh, really high throughput transactions. So like something maybe you wanted to hook up like an in real life, um, you know, transfer mechanism using custom tokens for like different events or games. Like this thing is perfect for that. I'm going to slow you down. I'm going to slow you down. Let's talk about NFTs. How about this? Something that I've wanted for some time. In fact, I've been asking you for some time. Um, <laughs> Is a, is, a, is, a, is a virtual machine dedicated to holding data for NFTs. So I know I'm, I'm sick and tired of NFTs, you know, images disappearing when companies disappear. I think Solana NFTs suffered from this. All of a sudden, uh, when, when some, some of the companies went under because of FTX, uh, their NFT images disappeared on them. So is that something that's doable with Hyper SDK? Yeah, so um, like the one, and you know, without getting too technical here, like the Hyper SDK, is there for you when you want to use certain parts of it. But at any point in time, you can override just about any component. <laughs> so if you wanted to like have a best effort or like an opt-in storage retention thing for anything that you upload, like NFTs, whatever, and then the nodes will just download it and then serve it themselves, you could add that. Now adding like layers of complexity of like replication and like fault tolerance and everything yeah. like that, again, if you want to add it, you could. Uh, Hyper SDK exposes a generic networking layer that you can send arbitrary messages to any other participant. So if you wanted to implement like a DHT on top of the Hyper SDK participants or like something like that, you know, it handles that component. So um, you could totally do something like that um, if you wanted to. So that's an explicit call to action. I think this is, you know, Back in my professor days, I would say this is a good master's project. Um, I would then say, you look, this should take, you know, I don't know, three days for Patrick. So whatever, uh, uh, 12 days for, uh, for, uh, for a super, super good programmer. I don't know. What's the, what's the multiplier? 10x? 30 days? Well, I mean, this is the, <laughs> this is the benefit, right? It's like, I'm, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm particularly knowledgeable about exactly how those storage DHT like replication mechanisms work. I've never built one myself. I know theoretically how they work. 
Mm -hmm. But that's the whole point of this, right? If you know that, well, you should write a module that other people can then use on their hyper SDK. And you don't have to worry about anything else. Just write a module that lets people do something like this. And so that's like the call to participate. You don't actually have to launch your own chain or launch your own thing to participate. There can be infinite modules in this thing that people can add. Like I'm gonna add the warp module. I'm gonna add the WASA Ooh. module. You could add the storage module and allow people to do this in their hyper SDK and contribute to the community. So I just wanna be really clear about that distinction, right? Cause some people think, oh, you know to actually interact with this SDK and use it you know, I have to launch my own chain. And that's not true. Like if you're just a researcher trying to get involved, building really cool things in blockchain, this is a great place to get involved. Yeah. Great. And if you use Hyper SDK and I use Hyper SDK, the, the chances of uh, merging our functionalities would be actually much better than if we were to start from scratch, right? There's yeah. And so the important thing here that we'll provide with the warp interface is a standard messaging format. So this will be the first format that's standardized for warp that lets any two hyper SDKs communicate with each other. Um, and so that'll be really critical for this, like, you know, kind of multi subnet story, which is we think really important to the growth of Avalanche and as well as the growth of just scaling blockchain in general. So, you know, if we have thousands of hyper SDKs running all doing 10,000 or more TPS that have the ability to interact with any two, any other subnet, I mean, I'll be pretty happy with that. Hopefully, hopefully you'll think I'm doing a good job, but uh, that's that's kind of what I'm shooting for. <laughs> well, and then one one last thing that I'd like to bring up again, it's a pet pet uh, pet project of mine that I would love to see, um, you know, energetic people take on, is um, is uh, essentially the entire class of Web two applied to blockchains, Web two without the custodian, Web two without the trusted entity. So um, I don't know about Twitter, but you know, whatever it is, pick your favorite Web two application and convert that into a blockchain form. Um, and so this would be a great framework to build that on. Am I right, wrong? I mean, I would say that like, just a brief aside, that's the best way to learn in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people I think that are trying to learn and like become a creator or a better builder, like spend all this time obsessing over picking the perfect idea. And as a result, it totally slows down their learning. They're like, I gotta have, like, when I show my first demo to someone, people gotta love it and like understand what it is. It is totally okay to just completely replicate the functionality of like a web two service on this just as a way to learn and understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you through that process, you'll probably have some pretty interesting ideas of how to make it novel and your own. Yeah. Um, and so this framework is the way to get started. And the whole point is, if you don't want to do anything complicated, it makes it easy for you not to do that. But if you start to learn a little bit and you're like, hey, I kind of want to override how gossiping works. Well, you can hook in your own gossiping thing later. Oh, you want to like, you know, change, like have some really interesting like metadata storage on the side. Yeah, you know, add that afterwards, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's supposed to be easy to start, but then continue to unlock increased complexity if, if you find reason to add it. Yeah, it's so Fantastic. So. Let me uh, let me also add this in. Uh, there are a couple of things that I would love to see on top of um, on top of Hyper SDK, and uh, I mentioned some of them. Uh, so I'm not going to go back and repeat them. But uh, but if you find yourself having built one of these as a proof of concept, and you need uh, you need some help to get to the next level, whether it's a grant, whether it's it's uh, it's just help of other kind, connecting to other people, etc. Et uh, I am here to help. We also have an ecosystem fund uh, for for projects that are uh, that are that are somewhat mature. So uh, so come talk to us. Come contact me, and uh, we'll be very very happy to support you. I'll be very happy to support you with grants, especially if you're a student. There is so much to do here, and this thing is a great foundation for for building uh, building exciting things on top. Um, do you want to end on a, on a call to action? What's what's the call to action for the viewers from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's like. Avalanche, I think, you know, becomes most successful when you have this like super diverse ecosystem of subnets and virtual machines doing all sorts of crazy things. And for me, that call to action is, um, you know, you can be a part of that today with any sort of open source contributions to the hyper SDK to building your own hyper virtual machine built on top of it. Um, but really, you know, my interest is trying to make Avalanche the best place for experimenters, people that want to just do interesting and crazy things. And so if uh, you're interested in doing interested and crazy things on top of blockchains to see what happens, um, you know, usually when people do that, 
we find something interesting or we learn something that helps us, you know, on the day to day. Um, and so, you know, if you have any ideas or things you want to do, feel free to reach out and I'll try my best to help out and, and see what can happen. But, um, you know, for us, this is really, uh, you know, the next step of the evolution of subnets, which is providing this native compute and framework for people to build their own thing. Uh, and, you know, if you want to be involved as part of that, uh, you know, now's the time. We've had had our first external contribution yesterday, so that's a big step again. Uh, and then, uh, you know, hopefully next week we have ten. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. That that's that's really great. So um, uh, there are some some uh, some uh, audience questions that I want to highlight. So um, let's maybe do them very very fast. I know you probably have something that you need to run to. We're running a little bit over time, but uh, but people are excited about this. So one question is, uh, you know, the the, the viewer is saying. I remember Patrick mentioning AWM, so warp messaging, version two, which will enable messaging between C chain and subnets. Can you give give uh, a few more details about how and maybe when to? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily like version two of warp messaging as much as just the further integration of warp messaging. Um, yeah, and I mean, this is a very common question we get and super important to a lot of people is how can I take value or data from the primary network and bring it to my subnet and bring it back. Um, you know, and this goes into the, one of our really core technical strategic goals of if you're anywhere in Avalanche, it should be easy and fast and cheap to get to another part of Avalanche, whether that's a subnet, whether that's another chain on the primary network core to what we do. And that's why, you know, core the extension is meant to ease that transition because uh, you know, it's just, you're really important to the story of Avalanche. Now, um, how that will work very specifically is um, on subnets, you know, when you're using warp messaging, a subnet will explicitly set the trust parameters for any message it gets from someone else. So, you know, if I spin up some malicious subnet and say like, mint me a million dollars, when you get that message, you're probably just going to say, I don't know what this is. I'm just going to drop it. Like, you know, not, not important to me. But on the C chain, unless we had like network upgrades every few hours, it's going to be really, it would be really hard to actually understand, uh, you know, when a message comes in, is it right, wrong, valid, you know, whatever. So the way that it's going to work is that a subnet will be able to produce a warp message and the C chain will just include the contents of that message with the percentage of stake that signed that message. So you'll just say, okay, like the C chain, basically you'll have a contract, like basically a call that will basically say, hey, you know, I got this message from this subnet, this percent of stake signed it. And then anyone can use that data to interact with another contract on the C chain. And then the contracts or like anyone that wants to support this functionality can just specify in that contract via governance parameters or multi-sig, which places they're willing to accept it from and what percent of stake is sufficient for that. So the whole point is let's put this avalanche specific thing in the context of the EVM in a way that's easy to interact with. Um, and then you don't have to worry about all of this kind of like constantly updating the C chain problem. So that's loosely the way it's gonna work. Okay, great. Um, next question. Could you, uh, let's see, could you implement a data stream for price feeds into the VM so that the conversions to trade tokens are dynamic? That's a good question. It's an Oracle question, right? An Oracle VM. Yeah. So, um, Sergey, this is from Sergey. <laughs> Hi, Sergey. <laughs> we can help. Yeah. You. I mean, so the challenge with doing any of these virtual machines, right, is like how deep do you go, and like how sidetracked do you get on these like rabid, like really deep random technical rabbit holes that probably mean nothing for your demo, right, or like whatever you're working on or anything like that. But no, this um, is this is its own Oracle VM. It's a dedicated Oracle VM. Sorry, I misunderstood. I thought it was a question about like adding a rate feed to the virtual machine demo that I was actually. You're right. I was I was um, generalizing, but the question is more specific. The way you yeah, so I'll, I'll, I can cover both of them. But yeah, I mean, yes, that's the whole point, right? So like the the cool thing that the hyper SDK does is in your in your virtual machine that you implement, it has this callback. So like when a block is accepted, it gives you all the transactions and their execution results. And so that's how I keep the order book up to date, for example, is listening to that callback. If you wanted to then, you know, take a look at the order book and generalize different rates or anything like that, you could totally add that. 
I don't know how to do that. I'm not a trader. So like, if you want to uh, put up a PR to like add that sort of functionality, that'd be great. Um, but that's, that's why we do this sort of thing in the open. Um, in terms of an Oracle subnet, this is really well suited for it because as an Oracle subnet, you probably are some trusted party or group of people that just wants to put data on chain. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the first blockchain projects I ever did was incorporating like a shelling point contract into a chain. And, um, for people that don't know shelling points, it's this really fun, you know, kind of thought experiment of how you can try to get people to align on correct data in a decentralized context. Um, but it'd be really cool to have like a shelling point Oracle system where anyone can participate with stake and everything like that and put content on chain. And then it would, that subnet would then emit uh, periodic warp messages um, that anyone else could ingest. So we have this any cast mechanism in warp that lets you basically broadcast bytes to everybody instead of just a particular subnet. And so then you could listen to that, that basically that warp feed and then just incorporate that into anything that needs pricing data or something like that. Um, so that'd be really cool. I love shelling points. There's so much fun. I, I do too. I, I built a shelling point uh, based uh, crowd Oracle back at Cornell and uh, the Cornell legal department kept me from uh, deploying it on the team, <laughs> but uh, it's a long story for another time. Um, let me ask you the final question, which I think is uh, uh, right on point. How does, and it's very, very uh, high level, and it's a good question to end on. How does Hyper SDK impact or benefit Avalanche? Good question. Yeah. So, I mean, the Hyper SDK um, is about taking Avalanche into really the area where we all want it to be, which is a platform for running whatever you could imagine. And I think we opened the page, like, you know, it really started off with like, you know, we can run anything you can imagine as long as it's the, as long as it's the EVM, that's going to work really well, but it stops there. And so this is about taking the next step, which is Avalanche is a crypto native platform for running anything you want to run. Like, you know, we call it chains for now, but it could be just about anything. And you know, this is this crypto native cloud platform, like to really like create a whole decentralized world on top of. And um, we have been asking people to do that and helping people and trying to get people to do that for so long, but we haven't been great at equipping them with the tools they need to do that outside of the EVM context. And this is the first real tool we're providing to push us forward and to shape that in a different direction, which is let's do a lot more novel and interesting stuff on Avalanche using our own runtimes, our own execution environments, doing our own thing. Um, let's start off with optimized things for particular use cases, because that's more straightforward and easier to do. But hopefully let's grow into, you know, different sort of smart contract platforms, different sort of execution environments um, and not have to reinvent the wheel every time. So that to me, this is about how do we provide really awesome performance to people out of the box that need it right now? but also unlock the ability to build all sorts of crazy custom and interesting uh, projects on top of Avalanche, which I, people probably felt that they could do previously, but they had no idea how. Mm -hmm. So this is supposed to, to move us in that direction. Perfect, thank you. Um, shall we, uh, I think we're way past the, the mark. Do you, do you have any last words? Um, how about the pointed question? What's your advice to the next bright kid from Wisconsin or where, what have you, Wisconsin equivalent for wherever, for any other country um, that, uh, that is excited about, uh, about tech, what would you say to them? I mean, uh, the thing with tech, like I said early on, is it's like, it's the one sure thing that I have found time and time again that can take anybody, no matter what their circumstances are, with enough work and put them anywhere in the world they want to go. And so, you know, if you feel that inkling to learn more about it, to get better at it, to become an engineer, to be a programmer, push, because it's going to be a fun and wild ride. Um, you know, at, at the same time, if, you know, you want to get more involved with it, open source has never been more vibrant in the history of any technology. And it's so easy to just get started, start working with other people online, contributing to them, like, the first contributor we had yesterday that it was the first external one, I have no idea who they are. They just showed up and were like, hey, you should do this differently. That's the magic of the internet and the magic of open source software. 
And so for people that are you know trying to get started, I don't think open source was nearly as far along as it was when I was in Wisconsin and I did not have access to the resources I needed to become a better engineer. Uh, but now the internet has, you know, millions of pages you can look at it you can ask chat gpt when you're stuck and you'll 75 percent of the time you'll get a right answer and then like uh you can deploy that and work with other people in open source right away and so i would just say you know it's never too early to try and you know people are always willing to help you out if you have the right intent perfect on that note thank you so much for your time patrick and thanks to the audience for uh, staying with us so come back next week have a great weekend and uh, in the meantime if you want to play along uh, with uh, Hyper SDK, or you want to uh, follow along with uh, Patrick's, uh, you know, foray into the space of building new VMs. Follow him and uh, look up uh, Hyper SDK's uh, URL. It's going to it's all over the the Avalanche feeds these days. Uh, take a look and uh, and feel free to build your applications. And if you have proofs of concept that need pushing, uh, some pushing to get to the next level, feel free to contact me and or us at uh, Avalabs. Thank you all very much. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody.